Hello? Hello? Is that 1995 calling? It makes phone calls. Its keyboard's a bit like a Blackberry, remember them, and it's from 1995. Think of it as either a clown car ThinkPad or a Sony Walkman running Windows. Unless you're of a certain age and hail from Japan, you'd have to be a real anorak to have seen one of these. This is the IBM PC 110. It's supposed to be a palm top. So before smartphones, you had palm top computers and mobile phones as separate devices. What were we thinking, right? The Samsung Galaxy and Apple iPhone trace their lineage to the palm top and pocket computers. The PC 110 is an interesting side trip on the journey to our current location in the evolution of mobile computing. Several makers came up with DOS and Windows based palm top computers. Atari kicked things off with the Portfolio, a DOS machine in 1989. Sharp had the PC 3000 series from 1991. Then there were the Tidal Wave based machines. Or, if you're an HP fancier, you might think back to the LX series, including the 95 in 1991, 100 and 200 LX in 1994. The arrival of MS-DOS in your pocket conceptually evolved out of the existing pocket computers. In the early to mid 80s, these were more typically basic driven machines, a bit like the home computers that they paralleled. They often arose from existing calculator ranges, so, Sharp, Casio, HP, and TI all had offerings here. IBM did not. It's when the DOS PC gets miniaturized that IBM eventually enters the story. Here's the tale, or at least as far as I've Googled it. IBM released their first notebook computer called the PS Note in Japan only. That was 1991. While that was in gestation, in 1990, IBM and office equipment company Rico started a joint venture, and they named it Rios, or at least that's how I'm choosing to pronounce it. Rios no longer exists. Rico absorbed them before the end of the decade. IBM gave this company, Rios, a design brief to build one of their next generation of laptops. The objective was to shrink it down to the size of a VHS cassette tape. The Rios engineering team worked with packaging specialists from IBM's Yasu laboratory. They put together a prototype and they called it Monolith. Monolith was first exhibited in 1992. The response from management was, just a bit bigger, please. Well, in 1993, IBM released the embiggened monolith, and they called it the ThinkPad 220. This model sold four times its intended production run. That well and truly launched what IBM referred to as the sub-notebook. We all remember the Seminole 200 series, right? Well, probably not. These systems never officially made it into Western markets. The Japan-only 200s were influential, though. They are often cited as the first machines in a new market category. IBM appears to have coined that term sub-notebook. Well, with the 220 out of the door, somebody at IBM thought, if there was a market for half a notebook, perhaps it'd be one for a quarter notebook, uh, a pocket PC. As I've said, other vendors were already making such things. One of the sources claims the idea was literally to build half a Model 220. That's half a sub-notebook. So if a notebook was a computer about the size of an A4 piece of paper and the sub-note an A5, then this was the computing equivalent of an A6. They called their half 220 a 110. See what they did there? The IBM PC 110 didn't come out until 1995, two years on from the 220. It made quite a bit of local press. This is in part because there was nothing calculator-ish about it. The most well-known of the other PC-based palm tops used simple black and white LCD screens and had limited or no graphics capabilities. The 110 was color, with a mouse, sound, and a modem. On its docking station, it had a floppy drive and all the usual ports of a typical laptop. The only sacrifice was in its core technology, which ran about a generation behind in compute power. Press interest doesn't seem to have translated into overwhelming sales, though. Apparently, there was plenty of stock left over to service a late 90s gray market. By then, the systems were being actively flogged in the US and Europe. Mine came west through that channel. As this was early on in the days of the internet, there were a few fan sites that popped up, and they contained tips and tricks for running Linux or OS2 or Windows 95, but today you'll have to use the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine to read them. I bought this example as a pure collector's item. I was actually looking for an early 500 series. I haven't found the right one of those yet, but this fairly mint novelty cropped up, so eBay parted me from my money. By default, it ran a Japanese language organizer package called PersonaWare. However, you can basically think of it as a tiny Windows 3.1 machine. And it'll also run Windows 95 pretty passively, just don't try and write War and Peace on it. The Japanese keyboard still trips me up. While the screen is color, retro gamers are also going to find even Solitaire challenging, because that's a dual-scan LCD technology right there. The refresh rate's pretty slow. So, 
basically it's a PC, right? Really the most interesting thing about it is just the way it was constructed. The thing is built like a high-end handycam of the time. Batteries are camcorder class batteries, and you can still get the exact ones, which are for a Panasonic. The Sony ones are a close fit in a pinch, but they're just oversized enough that you're going to need a guitar pick to ex extract them. Now there's also a clock battery which pops into the back, and that keeps the custom LCD in the front running. To really understand how this thing goes together, let's whip out the screwdrivers. The bottom case has screws. The outer shell is mostly metal composed of duraluminum. Easing it out of the way, we have a view of the mainboard, battery compartment, and RAM upgrade. The upgrade provides an additional 8 megabytes on the system. Add that to the 4 already on the main board, so you have a total of 12 meg overall. You could alternatively get a 16 meg RAM card upgrade for a total of 20. Next step is to gently pop off the screen hinge cover, and then even more gently, patiently, work around all the snap fittings holding the keyboard surround in place. I can't emphasize gently enough. The snaps are tiny, and the plastic IBM is using here is substantially more brittle than, say, the stuff from Toshiba. In the process of pulling this apart, I managed to damage mine. The trickiest bit of all is unplugging and then plugging back in the screen connectors. That's a little bit like doing a ship in a bottle. The power plug, that's easy enough, but then we have to deal with this ribbon cable buried under a ferrite deep in a hole. Once you do that, then there are two screws to come off holding one side of the screen in place, and the other side of the screen will just pivot out. That frees the screen up to set aside. Underneath that is the rear case plastic. That's got a few more screws and of course snaps. There's a separate panel for the IR cover, and that snaps off as well. Turning to the side, there's a trim panel decorating the PCMCIA slots with a few screws to undo. And then on the bottom, there are four ribbon cables tethering the keyboard and input devices to the main board. The keyboard assembly comes away as one piece, but it's got two gaming buttons on each side, a joystick come pointing device, and this pad, which is a digitizer. This is another fussy part of the design, as the flat flex passes through the chassis with relatively little play. They're not too difficult to remove, but fiddly to put back together. Take a few more screws out, and then ease the tape holding the right side buttons in place. That should free the keyboard. Now's a good time to point out that you can see the whole system is packaged around an internal framework. It's basically a space frame with stressed elements. You build a supercar the same way. The external panels are protective, but not especially structural. We've just revealed the modem board under the keyboard. The modem is one of the stressed components, and you can see it's screwed down to the chassis. On it, there's a Samsung SRAM and a firmware flash chip in the middle of the board. On the other side, there's a surface-mounted connector joining it to the main board. We'll just need to gently draw that apart, and as I pull this away, you'll see another flat flex. This is going to be the front microphone and speaker. As I lift that out, you can see the main modem chip is buried under other components, and silicon gunge. There's a micro coax cable snaking up to the phone jack at the back. That needs to be popped off too. Now you get a better view of the main board with the mini flash RAM card slot and PCMCA slots showing. You can also see trouble. In the middle of the right is the backup or bridge battery. That's a nickel metal hydride pack. It's there so you have time to swap between main battery packs. Follow the wires to the plugs. Now that plug shouldn't be turning blue green. That's a bad thing. Time to recycle this battery. Next, we're going to need to get the main board out. The main board is another stressed component, cross-bracing the perimeter space frame. To get it out, we need to unplug the screen hinge sensor. Then we can gently swing the whole thing out from the front edge clips. If we set that aside for just one moment, you're left with only the battery compartment and power board attached to the chassis. I pulled the screws out, but the board is soldered to the battery contacts, and those battery contacts are inside of a snap fit that I'm not keen to undo, given how brittle everything has been so far. So we can see everything we need to see anyway. Uh, the bottom is mostly passives. The principal control chips are up top. This power board is built around a Maxim 786 as a power supply controller. With all the other components removed, you get a picture of how little central structure there really is. Let's take a closer look at the motherboard. The first thing that we need to do is get the PCMCIA slots out of the way. They're on their own assembly, which screws in from the bottom. If we pop that off and we sit that out of the way, that leaves us with a naked motherboard. Now, let's zoom in on some of the key devices. We can start with the CPU. That's a Rios-branded Intel 46SX 33MHz processor. 
This is a low power variant and it skips the math coprocessor. Right below it is the main CPU controller. Again, this is a Rios rebadged part, but as I can't find the exact datasheet for it, this may have been a one-off variant. I'm only guessing, but it's close in part number to a bunch of other more common VLSI controllers. At the bottom here, you get the video controller. This is a chips and technology part, once again carrying a Rios stamp. Internally, this is driving an LCD panel with 640x480 resolution and 256 colors. The controller is supported by 512K of DRAM underneath of this chip on the other side of the board. Right next to the CPU is a Ricoh PCMCIA controller that's tied to a, a slot power controller right next to it. Below them is the boot ROM. At the top is a microcontroller that looks like it should be driving the LCD front display, but it's a pretty lightweight 4-bit skew. Further off to the right, there's another integrated microcontroller. It's specialized for LCD panels, however, it looks like it's more tied to those flat flexes. All but one of the flat flexes on this board go to the keyboard. The other goes to the digitizer. I don't think it's actually driving the digitizer, there appear to be custom ASICs for that. We'll see that on the other side. One other thing to draw your attention to on this side, do you see that silk screen with the code name of the monolith? That's a callback to the monolith prototype. I guess whoever did the board layout was anointing the PC-110 as its true successor. On the motherboard's flip side, you have the system status display poking directly out of the board, and then a profusion of large packages. Uh, the PC-110 is no system on a chip. Right next to the LCD, we appear to have a 1 megabyte mask ROM. This is located directly underneath of the processor, and what I'm guessing to be the LCD controller. The ROM doesn't look to trace out on the other side, so I'm guessing this is the LCD controller software. Next over to the right, we have two RAM chips making up the base system memory. Each is two megabytes. Now to the left of that ROM we were looking at, we have Pluto, and right beneath Pluto we have Bowman. These are both custom Rios ASICs. I don't have engineering data for either, so we're going to have to make some educated guesses. The two things we have to go on are proximity and process of elimination. Proximity-wise, these devices are right under the CPU and PCMCIA controllers. That should mean that they contain programmable gate array logic covering missing I.O. functions, missing as in we don't find them elsewhere. The reason I'd say that is it seems to be the right physical place to poke in for a device implementing the CPU bus, main ISA bus, or other controllers hanging directly off of either. So we'll park the custom silicon for a moment and come back once we know what's missing. Nestled in on the left is this little SMC device. The clue's in the part number, which starts with FDC. It's an ISA floppy controller. However, this particular part has a number of other functions built in. It's actually more of a general serial parallel I.O. controller. It has the IDE interface and the printer port. It's also got the infrared port and serial UART. It ticks a lot of boxes. So what else? South of Bowman, we have the audio complex. First, we have the Yamaha OPL2 synthesizer chip, and that's connected to a DAC, in this case, the Y3014B on the flip side of the board. Under the synth, you get the audio chip, and this is an ESS audio drive component, which is broadly Sound Blaster compatible. Traveling further east, we have the 512K video RAM I mentioned earlier. This is situated more or less underneath the graphics controller. And wandering northward, we have a Mitsubishi microcontroller. This is another micro specialized for running LCD panels like the one on the front edge of the machine. But it's miles away from that. And there was another micro next to that panel, so what's this one for? Any ideas? I'm guessing this acts as some kind of intelligence with a digitizer? Don't know. Of course, there's a lot more here in terms of glue logic, but those are the major devices. So let's go back to the custom ASICs. What were we missing? Well, the ISA bus controller itself for a start. We also need controllers for the keyboard, mouse, and extra gamer buttons. And we need a controller for the digitizer pad. How these are split out across those chips, I can't tell, but I'm guessing that they're all implemented here. Our last major component in the system is the 640x480 dual scan screen. That's 4.7 inches of it. Uh, that'll show 256 colors, and to get at that, we have to take out four screws at the different corners, and then there are some snap fittings across the bottom. Dual scan is a nearly forgotten technology now, but it was the cost-effective choice in 1995. TFT production had a dramatically lower yield, TFT is more power hungry too. With the case separated, we can get a good look at the LCD panel. This one comes from Citizen. According to the forums I've read, there are two different panels used over the course of the production run. The panel is tethered to a companion controller on one side, and then the backlight power supply is over on the other side. The actual lamps are inside the screen enclosure. I'm afraid I'm chickening out from opening that can. The panels are pretty hard to obtain, so I really didn't want to risk wrecking it. But just look at how heavily made the whole panel is. 
put it all back together and it becomes clear that this panel, rather than the surround, provides most of the strength of the screen structure. And I can tell you it's pretty rigid. The whole space frame and sandwich of stressed components making up this machine are quite stiff. It's rigid in a more than the sum of its parts kind of way. Basically it feels like a brick, although the relative high proportion of height to width helps. The biggest issue I've had is the relatively brittle plastics and of course your old favorite in mine, the leaking backup battery. Plastics, for instance, the mic switch is this whole widget up front and it slides from side to side. It's like a cap and it's clipped into place. Most of the snaps have gone on this. Or consider the upper keyboards around. It's held down with snaps all across it. At some point in the process of pulling it up, being as gentle as I know how, I've managed to crack it. Now next time I have the thing turned down for repairs, I'm going to have to epoxy that. Before putting it all back together, I spent some time on the other problem area. I cleaned back that battery damage. At that point, it became clear that this fine bodge wire here had corrosion creep from the tranny pad. I wasn't in practice enough with surface mount soldering techniques to tackle that immediately. It really means lifting that surface mount tranny to properly clean the pad and then drawing another bodge wire across. That's not something I fancy doing if I'm going to do it badly, so let it wait until my next kit-based project shows up in the post where I'm working for hours back-to-back -back soldering things. I think that's going to be a PyDP11. Watch this space. The 110 doesn't really require this to be fixed anyway, not to run, not unless I'm doing battery swaps. This really is an impressive little machine, if a bit of a pointless dead end. It's neat to have a fully compatible DOS machine in this form factor, and I can see how that might have made mobile and industrial applications easier to create from existing software. You can, after all, just run Windows software on it. Spreadsheets, word processors, DOS apps, games, just like any PC. But that compatibility didn't make this into a globally successful product. It remained a Japan-only, one-generation thing. The 110 had no direct successor. In another video, we should take a look at palm tops of the mid-90s and see what did make a successful one. But well, that's all for this video. Hope you enjoyed having a peek under the covers, and you'll find more photos from this teardown on Facebook and Instagram. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in other videos of this kind, subscribe to Beige Vision for more retro and vintage technology videos. See you soon.